Hey guys, this is the open fire, open source charcoal gasifier. And uh, a lot of people have been asking me more about it. There, there are no, uh, there are no plans yet, or other videos, or drawings for that matter. So I thought I would uh, just kind of give a brief walkthrough of the system, how we put it together, what it does, so on and so forth. So this is very informal, but uh, hopefully it'll provide just enough information for the people that want to know how it works. So that's what this is. <clears throat> the goal of the open fire was to be able to put together a somewhat powerful gasifier for very little money with no welding with easily sourced parts off the shelf parts and very little fabrication work and we were able to do that before I do release this to the public with schematics and CAD drawings uh, we are going to add some welding to this and we're going to upgrade some of the plastic upgrade some of the plastic parts to to metal parts for for a few reasons but let's uh let's talk about it in a minute right now we'll 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 sort of go through how the system works so first and foremost this big thing in the middle is just a standard propane tank cost me about 140 dollars at my local big box home improvement store it is turned upside down so what would normally be the top is down in the bottom and we actually sawed a hole through the trailer and uh, the top actually sticks below the bottom. There is a one inch orifice on the top of the propane tank now on the bottom. And um, so we had to put together a nozzle because this charcoal gas port is an updraft charcoal gasifier, not a downdraft invert style gasifier. So with a few parts, uh, we put together this nozzle. And um, this part right here is what screws in to, uh, to the, the bottom orifice. And this is the part that looks a little bit toasty, uh, is the part that actually sticks up into the propane tank. This pink tip is a TIG welding cup. This is for uh, TIG welders. It's made out of ceramic and uh, it can withstand uh, degrees, several thousand degrees Fahrenheit. As you can see here, this is a 5 16th TIG cup. And then what hangs off the bottom of the propane tank is uh, a, a one inch uh, mild steel pipe with a ball valve. Obviously you want that open, but this just basically screws in the bottom and sits about like, about like that. <clears throat> this uh, propane tank is filled with charcoal bits, um, usually under three quarters of an inch, um, preferably down to about three eighths of an inch in size. That's ideal. There's some differing opinions on ideal size and gas flow but that's that's about right and um, right now it's only about half full maybe maybe two-thirds so when that's full uh, and the air nozzle is screwed in uh, you basically light it from underneath so we'll get to this in a minute but right here is a blower motor DC bilge blower usually used for boats, three inch. And uh, that bilge blower provides a suction on this entire system. And that suction is uh, what pulls an air in through the air nozzle. So after that's going, uh, you just take a propane torch or a map gas torch and spray a little WD-40 or something up, up into the nozzle for, for ignition. And uh, you light it and once a, a once you get ignition, um, that 
that flame, although it's not really a flame, it's a plume, um, sort of has a life of its own. It, it grows to the optimal size based on air velocity and air flow. And, um, and that starts the process. So what happens is that creates gas and, and we'll, we'll go over that in a minute too. But the gas is sucked up through the tank and into, um, into this hose here. And what we did here for the hose is this is ABS pipe, which has a, a 180 degree Fahrenheit rating. And this is just the counterpart to that. This is the female, this is the male. And so what we did here is we used a JB weld, which is kind of like an epoxy and some silicone. And, and we cut a hole in the top of this tank, which was the original bottom of the propane tank. That way this can whole unit can unplug, pops right out, or this vacuum uh, hose actually can pull right out as well. And there's a reason for that. Then what happens is the gas goes down that tube and into a cyclone filter. And this is a plastic cyclone filter. Uh, we bought this primarily because it's cheaper and that we could see the action of the cy cyclonic motion. And this is a pretty neat system. It actually creates a vortex where heavier bits like dust and little pieces of charcoal or, or sawdust for that matter, if you have one of these in a wood shop, is pulled in right along the side here and gets flung on the outer walls. So it creates a vortex which takes the heavier particles and drops it out into a sealed airtight container, which that, that's what that is. And in the middle of the, that outer cyclone, there's an inner cyclone that goes up with clean air or in this case, clean gas. If right, properly sized and with the right velocities, this can be um, 93, 94, 95% efficient in getting all particulates out of, out of the uh, entrained gas flow, which is really impressive because it doesn't go through a membrane or any media. It's just literally using physics to, to do that. Uh, anybody that has a wood shop that has one of these would, would attest to how, uh, how awesome they are. And you can YouTube DIY cyclone filter and see all kinds of interesting things. People make these out of road cones and uh, it's just pretty neat. So what we did is this is um, all of these tubes and parts are uh, from the company uh, called Rigid. So it's a rigid vacuum cleaner hose. This is one and seven eighths inch. And if you get into ABS pipes or all this, you know, PVC pipes, um, didn't really have that dimension. So we had to, we had to sort of mate the two differing sizes. So this, this thing here is actually, again, JB welded onto the cyclone. And on top of that, uh, this little part here is also welded on. The hoses all come attached. Uh, additionally, uh, below, we have another four inch ABS pipe and this whole thing can pop off. Again, that's, that's done for a reason. I'll get to that in a minute. And this is a plastic PVC, or excuse me, plastic bucket with a gamma seal lid. It's an airtight lid. And what we did is we, we, we cut the inner part out. So it's, it was kind of flimsy plastic and we put in, we left a little bit of an edge and we put in um, three quarter inch plywood, which is extremely rigid. We screwed it down, epoxied it, and, um, and that's what that is. So what happens is the gas gets flung against the side of the cyclone filter, heavier particles drop out, and the lighter, cleaner gas comes up and down out, out of this. For, for our particular use, this isn't terribly efficient. Those are, you know, two inch fittings on this cyclone filter. And we're not pulling at tremendous speeds, so this is probably only 85% efficient, maybe less. I, I, we'd have to calculate that out, but for our purposes, it's worth having. 
The clean gas comes out of the top, comes around here. We have another gamma sealed lid plastic bucket. We drilled a hole through the size, to the side, rather, down here. And if you pull this off, that's another two inch ABS pipe. And that goes into the inner part of the box, inner part of the uh, bucket, excuse me. And what we have down in there, well, I don't, I don't want to open it right now, but we just have shredded pieces of foam in there, just open cell foam ripped up into little pieces about an inch or so just filled the whole thing and that's a final filter so any ash or particulate matter charcoal dust that gets in here is going to be caught by the foam and then the gas rises through the foam so what sits on top of this is a is the bilge blower this is DC powered um, I think it's underpowered for this unit, I'd like something about twice as powerful and ideally adjustable. So we'll replace that in the final. Again, guys, this is just sort of the alpha model of this unit. Lots of improvements to go, but it works. It works pretty well, actually. So this provides the suction. This is like a vacuum cleaner. It is um, protected from ignition. The motor's on the outside. There are no brushes. Uh, gas gets pulled up through here and it hits this this Y, this ABS pipe Y and um, three-way. We just put a cap on this end. We left this here in case we wanted to use a portion of the gas for something like cooking or a smaller motor. And um, when you're going to run an engine, it's going to go this way and you're going to going to open this this ball valve opens the gas comes through goes down into what used to be or what still is but that's the carb of a generator so the gas actually just goes right through the carb not through where liquid gasoline would go and this little guy here is just a a, a carburetor for air gas mixture so it's quite primitive it does work. You can choke it or you can open up and get a lean or rich burn, depending. Um, but before you can put it into the engine, um, you have to get it up to temperature. So when you first start it up, this remains closed. Therefore, the gas has to go up. Here's another ball valve. Now we're getting into metal pieces. This is one inch pipe all the way up to a flare top. And when you light this, smoke will come out the top it'll just be coming out and uh, at some point it hits a uh, the correct temperature and uh, you can light it and you light it with your propane torch or your map gas torch and um, and you flare it off and that's pretty common with wood gas or charcoal gasification is you light a flare and um, you let that burn a little bit and at that point um, you can close that ball valve and open up the PVC ball valve and then fire up your your generator on wood gas in this case almost entirely carbon monoxide so a little bit on how that works is you know what what makes this possible is pretty impressive and pretty cool when air gets pulled into that nozzle uh, let's see if I have that nozzle. Here we go. So here's the nozzle. When air gets pulled in through that and it's ignited, again we talked about lighting it with a propane torch, it creates a plume of incandescent carbon. That charcoal is red hot and glowing red hot just like if you're you're at a campfire and you've seen the, the charcoal burn down to red hot pieces the same thing happens in here very much like a blacksmith forge where moving air is constantly keeping those charcoals uh, red hot well ambient air is pulled through this this pulls air and ambient air contains about 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen the oxygen in the air 
uh, oxidizes the carbon. And that's what it does. It keeps it burning, just like when you blow on a fire and it, it, it picks up in, in heat. Uh, same thing happens. And that's called combustion. And those red hot charcoal, it's, pro it's probably shaped very similar to like a candle flame. It's probably football shaped. Uh, the part that's uh, that's burning hottest because of the suction, at least in, in this design, because it's an updraft. But that hot part is called the combustion zone. There's an area outside of the combustion zone called the reduction zone, and that's where all the voodoo magic happens with gasification. What happens is, is if the combustion zone's at the right temperature, and we're talking, you know, more than a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, um, ideally. Ideally, you want to get it up to about 1250 C, which is really, really hot. Uh, what happens is it rips everything down to its basic element. So carbon dioxide gets ripped into carbon and oxygen and steam. If, you, if there was a, a, a steam feed on this, if you had steam underneath, it would rip that to hydrogen and oxygen it disassociates molecules so that happens in the combustion zone it just rips everything to shreds on, on the molecular level and then when it after it goes through the combustion it goes through reduction and what happens is there's an endothermic reaction with the char on the outside of the combustion zone that uh, basically absorbs the heat and releases um, some of its mass in the form of carbon. And the oxygen from the ambient air will combine with the carbon and you get CO, otherwise known as carbon monoxide. A very flammable gas, also a very poisonous gas if you were to breathe it. Um, but all, the, you know, all wood gas or all producer gas has a large part of it is, is always carbon monoxide and engines run on it just fine. So that's what happens is you're basically making in large part carbon monoxide with a charcoal gas fire. If you had a, a biomass gas fire, you would have carbon monoxide, you would have hydrogen, you would have a little bit of methane, and so on. All of those are flammable gases. There, there are a couple of gases that are, that are sort of the downfall, if you were, the downside of wood gas, which is ambient air is 80% nitrogen. Nitrogen's an inert gas and it does not burn. Carbon dioxide is an inert gas and it does not burn. Although you can shift that into a burn burnable gas as we talked earlier about. So essentially, uh, through the magic of combustion and reduction, you're getting a burnable gas that you can make electricity with or run an engine that would make mechanical or electrical power right here. And let's, get, let's take a little closer look. This is a high temperature radiator hose. And this goes right down into uh, what was the carb of the engine. So if you see here, this is the this is just the carburetor. We open it up. That goes on here. We loosen that. We loosen this up and then tighten it back down. This is a uh, electric start. Gets the power from a lead acid battery. Also, also the uh, the bilge blower that's connected to this battery <clears throat> to uh, to get it started. And that's the basic unit. I paid less than seven hundred dollars for all the parts. The generator cost me one hundred and fifty dollars off Craigslist. I did have it rebuilt. I wanted it clean and uh, I paid a few hundred dollars for that. So all in all, I probably put in a little more than $500 on this generator and I paid $200 for a very small, cheap trailer from Harbor Freight, which is essentially a Chinese retailer here in the United States. Very cheap. Um, I probably wouldn't go with this if uh, I, I wanted to use this rig for a number of years. I'd probably go with a full size trailer, but the purpose for this build was to do it cheaply with off the shelf parts. Let me talk a little bit about engines. This is, this is an own end generator from the 1980s off of an RV. 
and the reason I wanted to use this rather than a new generator from Home Depot or Lowe's or or you know any uh, big box home improvement store is that this one runs at 1800 RPM so twice as slow as your typical 3600 RPM generator and the reason for that is the carbon monoxide has a very slow flame front it doesn't catch fire quickly in the pistons uh, it's rather slow and if it was pure carbon monoxide we probably wouldn't have a problem but since it's diluted with nitrogen we have an inert gas that's watering down that gas flow it makes it even a little harder to ignite it tends to ignite late so with an 1800 rpm generator because it's slower on the pistons uh, you get better performance than if this was a 3600 rpm generator in theory although this would work just fine on, a 30, on, your, on your typical Home Depot Honda, Honda type generator but those generators are only rated for about 500 hours of service this is a 25 year old generator that I had rebuilt that might last 20 years it's very heavy so I bought this because of the, the longevity not because that it produces a lot of electricity because it doesn't it's only a 4 kilowatt generator on wood gas I'd be even really pure good quality gas I'd be lucky to get three kilowatts out of it and probably I was able to get uh, two and a half kilowatts out of this or 2.5 on my load bank let me remember yeah 2.5 kilowatts and we, we t on, on our initial debut uh, we pulled a pretty good size load so I like this because it's built to last slower rpm it's more suited for for wood gas now if it had a better compression ratio it would be even better but it wasn't built as a natural gas engine or a diesel engine it's a gasoline engine so ideally you'd want to get a natural gas engine or a spark fired spark fired diesel conversion to get an ideal engine for wood gas so a lot of people say wow what about you talk about incredible heat um, 1500 C probably don't get that hot but at least 1200 C in there why why, uh, why do you have all these plastic parts aren't you worried about it melting and the answer is not at all it's uh, what's amazing about this process is that um, I could put my hand on the outside of that tank literally eight inches from the hottest part on the inter internal part and that feels just about like ambient air it only gets slightly warm after 15 minutes of running and the reason for that is that process of reduction the charcoal bits say you know give me your heat and I'll release a little bit of my mass in the form of carbon and uh, so it's it's literally a, a heat sponge so even as the gas moves up here's the hottest part let's say in the very middle part of this even up to here Let's see up to here if this was full. It's already room temperature. It's ambient temperature. This will never see anything hotter. From, in fact, this will get hotter from the sun hitting it than it will from the, from the gases that are coming through it. So these plastic parts are just fine. However, I don't want to use plastic parts for the open source design for safety issues. You don't have any problems with anything melting or heat problems but what you do have and the one thing to be really careful with this system is um, you are working with a gas that ignites it, it, it you can create an explosive situation here if you don't know what you're doing and it's really easy to operate one of these things it's really easy to learn but just because you uh, I don't have control over watching everybody build this and watching everybody use this uh, We'll probably switch those buckets out for metal buckets. Probably switch out to a metal cyclone. All of it will add cost, but we'll still be, uh, you know, in an affordable zone to produce power. Now, the really cool thing about um, charcoal gas fires is that if you need more power, um, all you do is you increase the diameter of your nozzle. Now, we're limited here because we have a one-inch pipe that's up to 
a 5 16 bit and um, if you wanted to run a car on this you could uh, a very small four cylinder car because now the weakest link is the diameter of the hose uh, we'd have to drill out a bigger hole in the bottom and, and put in a custom air nozzle that was significantly bigger than that one that one's about perfectly sized for a generator a four kilowatt generator but for a car we'd need to put you know a nozzle that it's about that big <clears throat> and uh, you'd burn through your charcoal much 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 quicker and have to do more refilling but um, but you could do it and that's all really you would need to change out especially because I'm using two inch hoses for this generator, I don't need two inches ho hoses. I could use a one inch hose, but those are hard to find and these vacuum hoses would work just fine with a, certainly with a motorcycle or a, go, uh, you know, a gasoline powered golf cart, this would be fine. Maybe a small car, you could get this to work pretty well. So that's, um, that's about it. You know, one, one, one last thing, we talked about these PV or these ABS pipe, uh, pieces for for the, uh, the the base of the cyclone in this. The reason I did that is so I could pop this off, put the cyclone up top here, hook it to a vacuum machine, and, and actually vacuum in all of your feedstock. All of your carbon bits, your charcoal pieces, would just drop right in the tank. And it works like a charm. It actually works really well. It might not be quite as fast as if you had, let's say, um, a funnel and you were just shoveling the charcoal bits in here, but it's dust free and it works, it works as designed. I was, I was pretty happy with that. I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but it works just fine. So this is, you know, this is basic, very, very basic gasification, charcoal gasification, very, very inexpensive. And you can get a uh, pretty massive power off this and and have uh, have some uh, energy independence from fossil fuels. I put my you know it doesn't have to be on a trailer. I put mine on a trailer so it's mobile. I'm I'm doing more demos than I'm really using this. But if you have a farm or a ranch, especially one with lots of biomass uh, with trees, you could set up a coppicing program or a pollarding program where you're literally growing trees as part of your energy independence plan not just fruit trees but we talk you know permaculture they talk about food fiber medicine and fuel i would um i would include some fast growing trees preferably uh nitrogen fixing trees and even better than that, maybe nitrogen fixing trees that provided fruit or nuts. If you're in, if you're in the in the high desert, um, mesquite is a great choice. If you're if you're up north, um, Osage orange or black locust or honey locust are great. They're nitrogen fixers that have very dense wood and make for very dense charcoal, um, and they're fairly quick, f fairly fast growing. If you're in the tropics bamboo would work fairly well though it's not nearly as dense it grows so fast that uh it works well it also makes a good biochar because of the loose cellular structure so wherever you are you can find a tree species that will that will work and um you just have to make charcoal through a through a charcoal retort there's a, a cheap you know what i did was i just bought two barrels a 55 gallon barrel and a a 30 gallon barrel and just did the double barrel retort. I made my charcoal, I crushed it. Um, in this case, I crushed it just with a, a tamp. This guy over here, this metal homemade tamper. Crushed it and I sifted it. If you see my car over here on top, I have, um, I have uh, two, uh, two screens here, two sieves. So one, two, those sieves catch um, anything bigger than three quarters of an inch, which has to go back to get crushed again. And anything smaller than a sixteenth of an inch falls right through and becomes biochar. And that goes right into my compost heap. 
and anything in between one sixteenth and three quarters is perfectly sized fuel for the for the charcoal gasifier. So, hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and I know there's a lot of questions on how it works and how it's built. So uh, this is extremely rough. Um, I'm sure I'll be doing this video again, but I think you guys uh, can figure figure out how it works and what we did. And in the spirit of making it affordable and attainable, um, hopefully motivate more people to get into uh, gasification as, as a part of the overall strategy for energy independence and uh, freedom from fossil fuels. Thank you.